Order. Questions without notice. Senator Brandis. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. I refer the Minister to the repeated warnings of BHP Billiton about the effect on the viability of the Olympic Dam project of the government's policies, and in particular the warning from the chairman of BHP Billiton, Mr Jack Nasser, who said on 16 May, quote, I cannot overstate how the level of uncertainty about Australia's tax system is generating negative investor reaction. People don't know where they are going." Unquote. Given the government failed to heed the warnings about the disastrous impact of its mining tax and its carbon tax on Olympic Dam, will the minister now apologise to the people of South Australia for costing them a $30 billion mining investment? the most significant Order. in the state's history and costing South Australia over 13,000 new jobs. Order. Order. The minister order. Order. The minister order. The minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I am asked about Olympic Dam, and as a South Australian, I'm very happy to talk about Olympic Dam. I am somewhat surprised that no South Australian Liberal Senator wanted to ask me about Olympic Dam. We have a Queenslander asking me. I am also, I am also asked about uncertainty. Well, let us be very clear that any uncertainty that is created in relation to the investment environment is because Tony Abbott, Mr Abbott, Mr Abbott is making clear he wants to remove he wants to remove a mining tax that the miners are prepared to pay. But I want to go precisely to the issue of Olympic Dam. I want to go precisely Senator to Wong, the issue Senator of Wong, Olympic Senator Wong just Dam. resume your seat. Resume your seat. Order. The minister continue. I want to go precisely to the issue of Olympic Dam because I, like every other South Australian, uh, perhaps except some in the Greens Party, was deeply disappointed with the decision of BHP Billiton to defer investment. The only people, Mr. President, who were cheering that decision were those opposite and Mr. Abbott. Those opposite, Mr. Abbott. A disgraceful attempt. A disgraceful attempt to use this decision to fuel their dishonest Senator, Senator Wong, campaign. Senator Wong, just resume your seat. Now, now when, when, there's, when there's silence, we'll proceed on both, si on both sides. Sen Senator Wong, continue. Thank you, Mr President. I refer the good senator. Uh, to the statement released by BHP Billiton in relation to this decision, the statement their leader could not be bothered reading, could not be bothered reading before he stood up at a press conference with all the South Australians to talk about how dreadful it was that everything else had stopped uh, Olympic Dam. The press, the news release from BHP Billiton. The release that is the statement to investors, to shareholders, to the markets, Mr. President. The statement that can be believed, which says that current market conditions, including subdued commodity prices and higher capital costs, had led this decision. No mention, no mention of the carbon price, no mention of the mining tax, which, if those opposite paid any attention, does not apply to the output of Olympic Dam, does not apply to the output of Olympic Dam. Those opposite should be ashamed Time of the way has they have expired. dealt with Time has expired. Senator Brandis. I refer, the, I refer the minister. Order. 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 Senator Brandis. I refer the minister to comments made by the Resources Minister, Mr Ferguson, on AM this morning when he said, quote, you've got to understand the resources boom is over. I also refer the minister to her own statement when asked on ABC 24 this morning about the mining boom when she said, quote, no, I think the mining boom still has a long way to run. <laughs> Who are Australians to believe, Minister Ferguson or you, Minister Wong? Order. Order. The minister. 
Oh, well, Mr. President, Australians certainly are not to believe the Leader of the Opposition on this yeah. issue. How did he go last night? Uh, How and, did he go uh, last night? Uh, and, uh, but but uh, I'm very happy to answer the question about the mining boom. Uh, Minister Ferguson is absolutely right when he says the mining boom in terms of the commodity prices that we have yeah. seen is over. Is over. Which is why the government has factored that into, factored that assumption into our budget. Which is why the budget assumes the terms of trade will step down, because we understand that the elevated prices that we have seen for Australia's commodities over these last years uh, cannot continue, and that is why we have factored that into the budget. Uh, there is no suggestion that the investment pipeline is somehow turned off. We have half a trillion dollars of investment in the pipeline in the resources sector in this country, over 50 per cent of that at the advanced stage. Well, the opposition don't want to hear that. They want to talk down the economy. They want to talk down South Australia. They don't like to actually support Time has Australian expired. jobs. Time's expired. Order. Order. Senator Brandis. Given this government's addic addiction to new taxes, such as the carbon tax and the mining tax, ongoing division at the highest levels of the government, and contra contradictory statements by senior ministers about the future of the resources boom, what confidence can the Australian people have that the suspension of Olympic Dam won't be the first of many resources projects to be lost because of the uncertainty created, as Mr Nasser warned, by this high-taxing, confused and dysfunctional government. Order. The, the minister. Uh, the addiction which is problematic here is the addiction to negativity of the Leader of the Opposition uh, and those opposite. And can I say, I, I, I am surprised. There was a time where the opposition had some senior members who represented South Australia and tried to represent, them, re represent our state responsibly. I did not always agree with Senator Minchin, but he did try and represent South Australia responsibly. But what we see now, what we see now is the members from South and senators from South Australia jumping on board what can only be called a disgraceful self-interested scare campaign, where they are saying to people, ignore what the HP have said, Order. ignore what the what HP Senator have Wong. said. Resume your seat. Order. When, when their silence will proceed. Senator Wong, continue. The, the position of the opposition, Mr President, is this. Please ignore what BHP has told the market. Please ignore what BHP has told its shareholders. Please ignore what BHP has told investors. But let instead believe what Tony Abbott said yeah. on the 730 you report. Need, you need That's to refer to people the in the other place is. by their correct title. Yeah. Se Senator, Senator Singh. Right. Order. Thank you. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Broadband Communications and the Digital Economy, Senator Conroy. Can the Minister provide advice to the Senate on the charges for using international mobile roving services? Does the Minister have any examples of how these have affected Australian consumers? The Minister for Broadband Communications and the Digital Economy, Senator Conroy. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. But uh, unfortunately, I don't know whether or not. French Telecom has any mobile services, so Malcolm has shares in them. But I wanted to thank uh, the senator for her question and for her interest in Australian. Oh, order! This morning I released a draft report with the Honourable Amy Adams, the New Zealand Minister for Communications, into the prices paid for international roaming between our countries. The draft report makes clear that consumers have been ripped off when using their mobile phones when travelling between our countries. The prices that people have to pay when they make a phone call or send a text or go online Mr. President, when they travel is frankly obscene. This draft report shows that margins made by telcos have been higher than 1,000 per cent. 1,000 per cent. And since the Australian and New Zealand governments announced this investigation, not surprisingly, the margins have come down, but they still remain unprecedentedly high at 300 per cent. 300 per cent. So the Senator asked whether I'm aware of any specific examples, Mr President, and can I say there are some shocking examples highlighted in today's papers. A mother who was a primary carer for her daughter with a long-term illness 
received a phone bill, Mr. President, of $4,800 after a holiday in. Senator, senators on my right and my left. Senator Conroy, continue. $4,800 after a holiday in New Zealand. She used her phone simply to stay in contact with the doctors, specialists and social workers during her holiday. And she had no idea that when she got home, her phone bill would be so ridiculously high. Another example is a student who asked for global roaming for her phone for a holiday to Malaysia, and she wasn't informed of the cost when she connected. And she got stunned Time's for expired. nine. Time has expired, Senator Conroy. Senator Singh. Thank you, Mr. Pre President. Supplementary. Can the minister advise what actions the government is proposing to take to improve the situation for trans Tasman roaming? Order. The the minister. Ian the minister. Will fix it. Mr. President, the draft report has undertaken detailed modelling to understand the costs faced by mobile operators in providing these roaming services. And as I said, the draft report finds that margins have been as high as 1,000 per cent and are at 300 per cent. And for this reason, the draft report recomm recommends actions by our respective governments, Mr. President. And so there are options for action, including legislation and regulation by both our countries, including the introduction of wholesale and retail price caps. We have released the draft to obtain views from users of roaming services and the telecommunications industry, Mr. President. Once submissions have been considered, the two governments will agree a joint course of action. And the mobile operators should be under no illusion. The New Zealand and Australian governments are determined to end this rort. Senator Singh. Mr. President, can the minister provide advice on any initiatives to improve the situation for Australians travelling to other countries? The minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Unfortunately, Mr. President, Australians are getting stung whether they use their phones overseas, not just when they go to New Zealand. To address markets where we aren't able to introduce coordinated regulation, Senator Macdonald, I'm also directing the ACMA to make an industry standard, and this standard will ensure that Australians receive an alert on their mobile phone when they land overseas. This will allow consumers to find out how much they will be charged when they make a call, when they send a text or when they go online. And this standard Mr. President, will protect all Australians, including Mr Turnbull, on his trips to Paris to check out how the fibre of the home network is going and his investment is. But this will, be, this, will, this will protect all Australians, including allowing them to actually not take the service. You'll be able to opt out. Time's expired. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change uh, and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. Uh, does the Minister agree that as a direct result of the introduction of Labor's carbon tax, uh, the Australian mining and metals production sectors will experience a significant decline in rates of return by 2020? Uh, reflecting lower demand and lower profitability. Order. Order. The Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. Uh, Mr President, uh, there are a great many things uh, which affect uh, the mining sector, and uh, amongst those, uh, prim primary amongst those, uh, is uh, the prices uh, that are paid by the world for commodities. Um, we've seen uh, very high prices uh, uh, for the commodities Australia exports, and that, that has obviously been a good thing for this nation. But as this uh, government has made clear, uh, the peak of the commodities price boom uh, has passed, which is why we are doing two things. The first, in a budgetary context, is to ensure uh, that the budget reflects the, the stepping down of the terms of trade, and it does. Uh, the, sec the second prices. is to ensure uh, that you plan for beyond the boom. Uh, and that you, in fact, invest the boom wisely, uh, recognising that you have to plan uh, for beyond it. Uh, and for this reason, as you know, the government has a range of investments in place. Some of those have been in the tax reform space. 
uh, which included, for example, the company tax cut that Senator Cormann opposed. Uh, but of course, they include things like the loss carryback uh, regime, which will assist particularly small business, uh, as well as the instant asset write-off. Uh, um, in terms of S S Senator Wong, resume your seat. Uh, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, point of order in relation to the requirement for the minister to be directly relevant. Uh, there was a very specific question as to whether the minister agreed or disagreed uh, whether the carbon tax would lead to significant declines in rates of return. Now, uh, in order to assist the minister to be directly relevant, she might want to refer to page 152 of the government's own Treasury modelling into the carbon tax, where exactly that point is That's made. Now, debating the issue, there's no point of order at this stage. The minister has still 51 seconds. Order remaining to answer the question, the Minister. Well, thank you, Mr President. In terms of uh, the point of order, uh, I think that Senator Cormann is now saying that we should rely on the Treasury modelling. Is that right? This is the same Treasury modelling. This order. is the same Treasury modelling he's been saying for months and months and months that we shouldn't rely on. Now he says he should, we should rely on it. It's a little bit like his position on the mining tax, which on the one hand he says won't raise any money, but on the other hand will kill investment. Just, well, just wait a minute, uh, Senator Brandis. Order. Senator Brand Order. Order. Senator Brandis. You chastise Senator Cormann for debating the issue in his, in his um, uh, point of order. The minister is now debating the question. A statement was put to her. Senator Cormann helpfully provided the source of the statement. She is merely being asked whether she agrees or disagrees with that statement. You should bring her to the question in the time remaining. Order. The minister has 26 seconds. There's no point of order. The minister has 26 seconds remaining to answer the question. The minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, uh, again, uh, what I'd say is that one of the primary drivers of investment in this country is what is occurring on global markets when it comes to investment in the resources sector. And if, if the policy um, uh, issues uh, such as the mining tax or, or price on carbon uh, have the effect that the opposition says, one wonders why it is we have continued to see climbing investment in this country since they were announced. Climbing investment in the resources sector Order. since they Time's were announced. Expired. Order. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, isn't it true to say that, consistent with the government's own Treasury modelling, uh, the government fully expected that its carbon price would cause, and I quote, a significant decline in rates of return by 2020 for Australian mining and metals production? Isn't it true that the same Treasury modelling of Labor's carbon price forecast? a reduction of investment in coal mining of 12.8 per cent, a decline of investment in manufacturing of 3.1 per cent and a decline of 2 per cent in investment in other mining by 2020. Order. The Minister. Mr President, uh, uh, unlike uh, uh, Senator Cormann, uh, I don't uh, decide to adopt Treasury modelling one day and then discard it the next. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's fascinating. He's seeking to pin me down as a tricky question by saying, do you agree with this modelling that I've been saying for two years is wrong? Oh, do you agree with this modelling that I've been saying for two years is wrong and is not worth the paper it's printed on? I'd like to pr provide you with all the hands up where you've said that. Mr President, what I would say is this. What I would say is this. We, are, we have seen unprecedented growth in investment in resources in this country. We have about half a trillion dollars worth of investment in the resources pipeline. Over 50 per cent over 50 per cent of that investment is at the advanced or committed stage. Now, there is no doubt we will shift from an investment phase to a production phase uh, in terms of the mining boom. There is no doubt. Uh, and the Minerals uh, Council themselves say that, Mr. President. But unlike those opposite, we will deal with the facts. We will deal with the facts and we will not deal uh, with a disgraceful scare campaign Order, in our political self-interest. Order. 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 Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, why is the government so surprised that in the wake of significant increases in the cost of doing business in Australia, as a result of the carbon tax, the mining tax, a plethora of other new or increased taxes and more than 18,000 new regulations, businesses like BHP Billiton decide to reduce their investments in Australia, such as Olympic Dam. Is the government really so out of touch to think that no amount of additional taxation and red tape will have an impact on our economic fortunes and on our cost of living? The, the, the Minister. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I'm happy to take a question from Western Australian Senator about uh, the uh, Olympic Dam expansion. Uh, uh, not, not a South Australian, of course. They're clear, clearly not interested, the South Australian Liberal Senators, in the expansion of Olympic Dam, an important project Order. for Australia. Order. Order. Senator Cormann. Point of order in relation to the requirement to be directly relevant. How can the minister's abuse on this issue in response to the question actually be uh, directly relevant to the question? Order. The, I, order. Order. I do draw the minister's attention to the question. The minister has 45 seconds remaining. The minister. Uh, well, thank you. I am very happy to talk about Olympic Dam. And as I said in answer to the question from the Queensland Senator, Senator Brandis, uh, the BHP Billiton have made very clear the reasons for the shelving of the expansion. Unlike those opposite, we are deeply disappointed in that decision. Unlike those opposite, we are deeply disappointed in that, in that decision. Uh, and uh, whilst this may not be an issue for Senator Cormann, and it is an issue for South Australians, uh, we do not think uh, people trying to make a political game out of this issue. We do not think the leader of the opposition for engaging in a self-interested, dishonest and disgraceful scare campaign around this issue. We want to get on with the job uh, of, of working with BHP to seek to ensure that this expansion can go ahead. Time's expired. Senator Rhiannon. Thank you, Mr President. I direct my question to the Foreign Minister, Senator Bob Carr. Is the minister aware that during the Howard government's Pacific Solution, former Labor Shadow Minister for International Development Assistance, Bob McMullen, heavily criticised the then government for spending $27 million in aid money on detention centres in Nauru and Manus Island? And does the minister agree that spending aid money on offshore processing is inappropriate and distorts the aid budget away from the key objective of poverty alleviation and achieving the Millennium Development Goals? Order. The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Bob Carr. Mr President, the guide for the government on the appropriate use of aid money is the OECD. The OECD work on this lays down guidelines about what areas of expenditure assisting asylum seekers uh, would be appropriately funded from an aid budget, and the government will adhere to OECD guidelines. Um, it could well be that there are, there are areas of support for asylum seekers, where that is considered, according to the international tests, appropriate, and other areas where it would not be appropriate. Uh, we will be absolutely transparent about this, and uh, I look forward, as the government's plans develop, to sharing with the Senate the, uh, any, uh, any uh, expenditure of Australian aid money on any aspects related to the, uh, to the government's um, solution. Bear in mind, uh, Mr. President, that the expert panel report vindicates the government's approach to uh, uh, the whole aspect of seeking offshore processing that is humane, in that it provides a disincentive for the work of people smugglers and uh, efficient in wrecking the business model for people smugglers and providing a disincentive for people to risk their lives on the high sea. That expert panel report, in fact, vindicates the government's approach, including the Malaysian arrangement, and uh, is the basis for the government also, uh, <coughs> also proceeding to expedite the establishment of processing centres on Manus Island and Nauru. The Prime Minister said this and addressed these concerns when she spoke uh, on Tuesday, August the 14th. Um, I, might, I might mention, Mr. President, that reconnaissance teams have completed visits to Nauru and Manus Island. Uh, as recently as last week, they have provided advice on logistics and other administrative and organisational issues. Senior officials Time has expired. Senator Rhiannon. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Under the OECD guidelines, Minister, what aspects of the work on, the de um, on getting the detention centres on Manus and Nauru can be undertaken? Um, is it construction, um, staffing, implementation? Uh, could you provide inf information on how that money can be spent? And if, if the money is spent, on the detention centres, will you publicly <coughs> reveal the figures at the time the money is committed, rather than waiting until the 2013-14 budget? The Minister. M Mr President, uh, I can give the, uh, the senator—these are legitimate questions—I can give the senator uh, an assurance 
that I will share with, uh, with her and the rest of the Senate the, uh, the, uh, the government contribution um, from the aid budget to anything related to this package of measures to achieve a more satisfactory resolution of the whole issue of people smuggling and asylum seeking of irregular maritime arrivals. We'll be guided by, we'll be guided by the OECD guidelines. We're consulting the OECD at the present time. I, uh, I just underline the fact that um, work on this is still proceeding. The consultations by our task forces with the government of Nauru um, have, have a way to run. Senior officials are undertaking discussions this week uh, with Foreign Minister Keke on the details of a memorandum of understanding. Officials will be working as quickly as possible to conclude negotiations. Time's expired, Senator Bob Carr. Senator Rihanna. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, have you had any discussions with AusAid or the Department of Immigration and Citizen Citizenship about aid money going to Manus Island or to PNG or to offshore processing as a result of the recent agreement? And um, what aspects of the um, and and will you, will you reveal? What, does it, what the advice from the OECD is with regard to um, if aid money can be spent on these detention centres, and if so, what aspects of the detention centres it can be spent on? Minister, uh, my short answer is yes. I, uh, I, it's, it's still to be clarified how OECD guidelines on the classification of uh, aid money would have any bearing on this. I would expect it to be tangential to the, um, the major government investment required to, uh, to establish these facilities. Um, I, uh, as I said um, earlier, officials, senior officials are undertaking discussions as recently as, as uh, a few days ago with the government in Nauru towards the details of a memorandum of understanding, and officials will, will be working as quickly as possible to conclude negotiations and agree on the details of arrangements with Nauru and uh, Papua New Guinea. Uh, these are legitimate concerns, and I'm, uh, I'm happy to be uh, uh, forthcoming when we've nailed the details down. And uh, again, I'm happy to share them with the House and the Senator before the budget. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. I refer the minister to the comments of BHP Billiton CEO Marius Kloppers in his speech to the Perth Business Breakfast just 11 weeks ago on the 6th of June this year, in which he said, and I quote, things like increased operating cost, carbon taxes and so on have all conspired to turn this from a fairly low cost environment and therefore competitive to a higher cost environment. I ask the minister, has the application of the carbon tax created a higher cost environment, as Mr Kloppers says, for a company like BHP Billiton? Order. Order. The minister. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, and uh, I thank uh, Senator Birmingham, who is a South Australian, for asking a question that's tangentially related to Olympic Dam. Third, third time lucky, Senator. Third time lucky shows how important South Australia is in the tactics room. Uh, I, 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 I'm happy to discuss what uh, Mr. D Dr. Coppers has said. Uh, the first co quote I'd give to you is this. The South Australian government, the federal government, all of the agencies that have worked with us to make this a reality have been absolutely wonderful partners to have, and I can't put that in more strong terms. The second point I'd make uh, is, uh, again, that the MRRT, of course, does not apply to the output from Olympic Dam. Uh, Order. The MRRT, well, perhaps you should let, let Tony Abbott know that, Senator. Perhaps you should let Tony Abbott know Order. that, because You're he's the one that You need so. to refer to people Mr. in the other place by their correct Order, title. Mr. Uh, if the senator knows it doesn't apply, why does he stand next to the leader of the opposition while the leader of the opposition blames, amongst other things, the mining tax for the shelving of the Olympic Dam expansion? If you know it, why is it that you just stand by while he says things which are blatantly untrue? Order. I'm not surprised Order. you're standing up. Order. Order. Just wait a minute. Wait. You'll get the call when there's silence. 
Ora. 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 Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, there was one question only for a matter of direct relevance to this, one question only in the question I asked, and that was whether the application of the carbon tax had, as Mr. Kloppers had indicated previously, created a higher cost environment for a company like BHP Billiton. The minister has not come close to the carbon tax yet, and I would ask you to draw her to the direct relevance of the question. Senator Evans. Mr. President, uh, the senator referred to uh, Mr. Kloppis's uh, public comments and referred to the context of the uh, investment environment in Australia. The Senator Wong has been uh, responded to that directly by referring to uh, uh, other public comments of Mr. Kloppers and referring to the investment environment, which has constantly been raised by those opposite, which involves also the uh, MRRT. So she is perfectly uh, relevant to the question and is providing a comprehensive answer to uh, that put by the Senator. There is no point of order. The minister has 57 seconds remaining. The minister. Thank you. I again refer um, Senator uh, Birmingham to the statement that the Leader of the Opposition declined to read, which was the uh, announcement by Olympic Dam of this decision, in which uh, the, the, the reasons for the decision were referenced. I would also refer uh, the Senator to uh, Mr Copper's statement uh, in his teleconference, where he indicated that the decision was almost wholly associated with, in the first instance, capital costs, which is not only an Australian issue. He then also went on to describe the fact that the MRRT uh, does not apply to the output of Olympic Dam, despite the fact does, despite the fact that the Leader of the Opposition, including the Senator, uh, the, including the Senator continue uh, out there in the public arena, continue, uh, continue to put this. And, you know, if the Senator really was concerned about this issue, he should get on Adelaide Radio and contradict the Leader of the Opposition. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr President. Supplementary question. And I refer the Minister to the published ENGERS data, which indicates that the different operating entities of BHP Billiton reported more than 9.5 million tonnes of direct emissions in 2010-11, a figure that could only go up had the Olympic Dam expansion proceeded. Even after the application of so-called free permits, wouldn't BHP Billiton face a carbon tax liability of tens, if not hundreds, of millions of dollars each and every year? Order. The Minister. Well, Mr President, self-evidently the Olympic Dam extension cannot be included in the figures that the Senator has just put to me, self-evidently. Uh, and, and, uh, I'll take the interjection from Senator Brandis, who says it's not going to happen because of, uh, because of carbon. Well, what Senator Brandis and Senator Birmingham, Senator ba Brandis and Senator Birmingham are asking us to do is to, and all, and asking Australians to do is to ignore the statement from BHP to the market to the stock exchange, to shareholders and investors about the reasons for this, about the reasons for this, and to believe their baseless, disgraceful fear campaign. That's what you that's what you're asking. That is what you are asking Australians to do. I am deeply disappointed with the decision not to proceed at this stage with the expansion of Olympic Dam. I am deeply disappointed. Those opposite uh, those opposite are the only ones who are cheerful about this, Mr. President. Those opposite are the only ones who are gleeful about this. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, second supplementary. I now refer the minister to the email to staff from Dean Dalavao, the president of BHP's uranium division, in which he described the cost of doing business in Australia as having reached a record high. Will the minister and the government accept? any responsibility, any at all, for the record high cost of doing business in Australia, which is impeding projects like the Olympic Dam expansion. Order. Order. The Minister. 
Mr. President. Well, uh, if the opposition are advocating for low wages and conditions, they should be honest enough to come out and tell people they are. They should be honest enough to come out and tell people they are. What I would say to the opposition is this. Oh, you don't like Sen the truth, do Senator you? Wong. You don't like the Senator truth. Wong. Come on. Senator Wong. Senator Wong, just resume your seat. Order. Order. Now, can I remind honourable senators that the time to debate the issue is after question time at three o'clock. Those on both sides wishing to debate it can save their debating till then. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Conroy. The minister will continue. The minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Again, I say, if the opposition are planning and seeking, advocating the reduction of wages and conditions as one of the cost inputs, they should be uh, big enough to come and say so. But I note they always run away. They always run away when this issue is raised, and I predict you will now. I predict you will now. If I'm and I'm asked also about, Mr. President, about the effect on investment. Well, Mr. President, planned mining investment in 12-13 is around $119 billion. That is two and a half, two and a half, two and a half times, two and a half times the investment, actual investment in 10-11. If these, if the investment environment is so bad, how can they explain that sort of ramp up in investment? The only answer is because it's in their political interest to talk Order. down the economy. Times ex Order. Times expired. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question this afternoon is for the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Bob Carr. Can the Minister please update the Senate on Australian government efforts to support women and girls in developing countries around the world? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Bob Carr. Mr President, uh, I acknowledge the visit uh, of the Executive Director of UN Women, Under Secretary General of the UN, Ms Michelle Bachelet. She was the first woman President of Chile, indeed the first woman ever elected Head of State of any South American country. She now leads the UN's effort to promote gender equality and empower women. Australia, I'm proud to say, all Senators should be proud to acknowledge, is the fifth largest donor to UN Women and we're on track to be the second largest donor by 2016, and we should be. In its 2012 World Development Report, the World Bank found that by eliminating discrimination against female workers, global productivity per worker could be increased by up to 40 per cent. That's why we are, in Indonesia, creating over 330,000 new primary school places of which half will be for girls. That's why in Sri Lanka we're assisting over 2,000 women in rural areas to access training and obtain small business loans to improve their lives. That's why in Papua New Guinea we've improved access to justice for women by increasing the number of female magistrates in the village court systems of that country from just over 10 seven years ago to over 600 today. From just over 10 to over 600 today. A terrific example of Australian aid at work promoting the position of women in, uh, in a developing country, in this case PNG. In Uruzgan province, Afghanistan, Australian aids provided basic health and hygiene education to 8,000 primary school students, 34 per cent of them girls. In Fiji, we have supported a new electronic welfare payment system that has assisted 17,000 people, 63 per cent of whom— Senator Bob Carr. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister further update the Senate on Australian government support for UN women? Minister. Mr President. Australia is a committed supporter of UN Women. Today I announced a further Australian contribution of $6.7 million to support the work of this body. This is specifically targeted at funding refuges, counselling and legal support, 
for women driven from their homes by domestic violence. It will support women in Cambodia and Uganda who have suffered from revenge crimes like acid attacks for perceived slights. It includes counselling and support for women sexually assaulted in conflict zones, including in Liberia, where there is evidence, where there is evidence of rape being used as a weapon of war during the civil uprising. It builds on other Australian initiatives, including doubling funding for family planning services in developing countries to $50 million a year by 2016 to prevent unwanted pregnancies and save its estimated around 200,000 lives. Expired. Senator Pratt. Mr President, can the minister update the Senate on Australia's efforts to stop violence against women in developing countries? Minister. Mr President, the Australian community has zero tolerance for violence against women. AusAid is working with our partner countries to eliminate violence against women. In Papua New Guinea, we've established family support centres in 11 hospitals offering treatment, counselling and referral services for women and children subjected to violence. In Fiji, we've recently provided counselling and support services through the Fiji Women's Crisis Centre to more than 3,700 women who have been subjected to violence. In Cambodia, we've helped train more than 20,000 people to take part in, cr in community crime prevention activities, and that includes awareness of violence against women. The Australian government will continue to focus on ending violence against women and girls in developing countries. And I might say what a great pleasure it was today to discuss these matters uh, with Michelle uh, Bachelet, a great Time champion has of women's expired. rights. Time has expired. Senator Bernardi. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. I also refer the Minister to the decision by BHP Billiton to indefinitely defer the $30 billion Olympic Dam expansion, which sees 13,000 potential new job opportunities in South Australia indefinitely deferred. Given this is a devastating blow to South Australia, can the Minister categorically rule out the carbon tax, the mining tax? increased union militancy or the axing of the promised company tax cuts as playing any role in making the Olympic Dam expansion a less attractive proposition than would otherwise have been the case. Order. Um, oh. Oh. Order. 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 The Minister can answer that part of the question that refers to her portfolio. The Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, well, if you ever wanted an indication of a whole range of conspiracy theories oh, yeah. from Senator Bernardi, you've oh, seen yeah. them again. Uh, he claims in that answer, in that question, that the mining tax is to blame, a mining tax that doesn't apply. Uh, to the resources that are being mined at Olympic Dam. Now, I would have thought, as a South Australian, he would know that. He would know that. But let's never let the truth get in the way of a good scare campaign when it comes to the right of the coalition, right of the Liberal Party. Uh, I also note his reference to union militancy. I, I have no idea what he is talking about, other than, other than perhaps uh, the agenda from the coalition, which they refuse to confess, on, which is a, they want a reduction in wages move, and conditions. Victoria. That's what they are really talking about, Mr. President. When they come, when they come and Senator Wong, here and talk about resume your seat. Senator Bernardi is on his feet. Order, Senator Bernardi. I'll give you the call when there's silence. Order. Order. Senator Bernardi. Mr President, um, my point of order is on relevance. I asked if the minister could categorically rule out any number of factors in determining BHP's uh, decision. And in respect to union militancy, might I remind the senator that it was probably when she was storming the gates of Parliament House before she was a senator is the sorts of unattractive union order. activities that we like, don't like. There's no, there's no point of order there. The minister is addressing the question. The, the minister has one minute 11 remaining. The minister. Order. Uh, Mr President, uh, the decision— I told you I watch the NBS. Order. Thank you. 
I think that was actually my own side, Mr. President. So, uh, the decision to uh, sh uh, uh, shelve the Olympic Dam expansion was for the re was was for the reasons set out uh, in BHP's what well, was were for reasons uh, known to the BHP board, and the reasons that they have advised the market are the ones to which I have referred on numerous occasions already in this question time. Already in this question time, and if the senator does care about job opportunities in South Australia, he should get up and support the investment in in Holdens, which his party opposes. The investment in Holdens, which your party opposes. The investment in the submarines. The investment in the submarines, the largest defence project in Australia's history, which Mr. Hockey says he doesn't want to build in Adelaide. He's not interested in putting them in Adelaide, and he should get up and oppose the per capita GST distribution which would cost our state a billion dollars that Mr. Mr Abbott has said he thinks is, uh, is a sensible way to go. That's, it. That's what the senator should do if he really cares about the economy Time of his home state of South Australia. Senator Bernardi. Senator Bernardi. Thank you, Mr President. I refer the minister to the statement issued yesterday by BHP Billiton in which CEO Marius Kloppers is quoted as saying, and I quote, all investment options are scrutinised as they move through our approvals process. Just, Sen Senator highest... Bernardi, just wait a minute. You're entitled <laughs> to be heard in silence. Would you Senator like me to start again, No, Mr. you just continue. Order. And, and, and he finished Order. 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 Senator Bernardi, keep going. In which he can continue by saying that our highest returning projects are prioritised. Does the minister accept the higher operating costs in Australia, including as a result of government policies like the carbon tax, make projects like the Olympic Dam expansion less likely to be prioritised for investment compared with the many other investment options that exist worldwide? Order. The, order. Order. The, the minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I congratulate Senator Bernardi on reading the statement that his leader declined to bother reading before standing up publicly to engage in the scare campaign. At least he, he Just, had. Uh, uh, Senator Wong, I, I cannot hear a word you are saying because of the order, because of the conversation that's taking place across the front of the chamber. The minister. Order, order, order. The Minister. Uh, Mr President, uh, I was congratulating Senator uh, Bernardi. In fact, I was Order. 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 It's all right. I don't Order. Uh, Sen Senator Wong. Senator Wong. I was, in fact, uh, congratulating Senator Ber Bernardi for for, for, uh, for uh, actually reading the statement, uh, and I'd refer him to the, the, uh, the paragraph, two paragraphs prior to the one he read out, uh, in which uh, the, Mr Klopper said current market conditions, including subdued commodity prices and high capital costs, had led to the decision. Uh, so uh, I would invite the senator to consider uh, the possibility that the Australian people should uh, trust what BHP has told the market, not what his leader is seeking uh, to, to tell Australians Order. when he stands Order. up as part of this scare campaign. Senator Bernardi. Thank you, Mr President. Will the minister simply confirm whether the carbon tax makes it cheaper for BHP Billiton to pursue the Olympic Dam expansion or more expensive? Now, when there's silence, we'll proceed. The Minister. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, uh, the uh, implication of the question is quite clearly, again, the same position that has been put by uh, coalition senators. Order. Order. The Minister. Continue. It's the same proposition that the coalition have continued with in this uh, question time as they have, as they have. Order, uh, Minister. 
Ignore the, Minister, ignore the interjections. They disorderly. Order. Order. Min Minister. Address. Could I just make the point that calling on the Minister to ignore the interjections is difficult when they are persistent, loud, and, uh, and, and made by a whole number of senators uh, on the coalition side. So I think it's fair for the minister to pause while she can uh, hear herself and the rest of the chamber can hear herself over the shouting. So I suggest that uh, the minister is entitled to pause until there's some order in the, in the chamber. The, min the minister is given a order. See, the, prob the problem that we've got Senator Cameron, is that the interjections come from both sides, and they are disorderly on both sides. The minister will be heard in silence. The minister is entitled to be heard in silence, and if you wish to debate the issue, the time to debate it is after question time. The minister, continue. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, uh, I again refer the Senate. Uh, and Senator Bernardi to the statements issued by BHP Billiton to the market shareholders and investors, which put very clearly uh, the reasons they have chosen to shelve this expansion. Uh, I would, uh, well, uh, you know, Senator Birmingham Order. desperately interjects Order. saying some of the reasons. I, what he is actually saying is ignore what BHP is saying and listen to me. Ignore what BHP is saying is listen to me, as is Senator Bernardi, Mr. President. Mr. President, since the carbon price and mining tax were announced, we have Order. seen continued Time has and expired. Order. Order. If you wish to debate the issue, as I've said before, the time is after three o'clock. Order. Senator Xenophon. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Ludwig. Uh, it is common practice for private health funds to pay less to private hospitals in South Australia than they pay for the same procedures elsewhere in Australia. The Private Hospital Data Bureau Annual Report 2010-11 reveals that if all the care undertaken in South Australian private hospitals had been priced at the national rates, the revenue returned to South Australian private hospitals would have been 17 per cent or $75 million higher. Is the minister aware of this? And if so, can the minister provide information on any action the government has taken or is planning to take to address this apparent disparity and the immense pressure it is placing on South Australian private hospitals? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Ludwig. Thank you, Mr President. I thank uh, Senator Xenophon for his question in relation to uh, private hospitals in South Australia. Uh, I understand that Minister Plebisek is aware uh, of uh, this uh, issue. I understand that uh, she does and has been corresponded to uh, in respect of it. Uh, in part to the second quest question, uh, the Commonwealth uh, does not uh, regulate uh, private hospital charges. J just wait, wait a minute, Senator Ludwig. Senator Xenophon is entitled to hear the answer to his question and not have people immediately to his left and right debating other matters across the chamber. It's completely disorderly. Senator Ludwig, continue. Uh, thank you. The Commonwealth does not regulate private hospital charges. The Commonwealth does regulate private health insurance benefits. Private hospitals are free to set their own charges. Private health insurers and private hospitals commonly contract for the provisions of services and accommodation. And these are commercial decisions negotiated between the party. The government does not have any regulatory power to force the parties to agree to particular levels uh, of benefits payables. Hospital case mix protocol data shows that about 98.1 per cent uh, of private hospital episodes and about 92 per cent of day surgery episodes uh, were contracted. So the vast majority uh, of these are contracted uh, directly. With regard to South Australia, it, it can be noted that the data released by the Private Health Insurance Administrative Council indicated that out-of-pocket costs are lower uh, in South Australia for a hospital episode than in any other state. And at June 2012, the percent of the percentage of services with no medical gap is higher in South Australia at about 93.2 per cent 
compared with other states and territories, which range uh, variously from 77 per cent right up to the 90 per cent mark. Additionally, South Australia has the lowest average gap payment across all services. In South Australia, the average is about $5.33, while in other states it ranges uh, from as high as $67. Time to expire, Senator was... Ludwig. Senator Xenophon. Um, supplementary. Does, does the minister concede that whilst the, the government doesn't have the power to regulate private hospital charges, it does have the power to regulate disputes between private hospitals and, uh, uh, and health funds? Um, does the government consider that there is a discrepancy uh, in terms of the 17 per cent figure quoted, and that this does disadvantage South Australian private hospitals, uh, given what private hospitals have told me about the pressure it's putting on them? The Minister. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, thanks, uh, Senator Xenophon, for his supplementary question. Uh, one of the areas, of course, is—and I will go to it again—is that, as previously noted, it is a matter that private hospitals are free to set their own charges. There is no role for the Commonwealth in that area. The Commonwealth only regulates the private health insurance benefits. But any contracted level of benefits that a private health insurer will pay to a hospital for an episode of treatment uh, is and remains a commercial matter between uh, the parties. Uh, it should be noted for the purposes of private health legislation, though, each state and territory uh, is and is regarded as a separate risk equalisation jurisdiction. Uh, in Australia, private health insurance is not risk rated like most forms of insurance. Instead, uh, Mr. President, uh, the government requires all insurers to offer community rated policies to ensure that uh, premiums paid by consumers does not. Senator Xenophon. Does the minister not concede that uh, private hospital um, charges are in part uh, related to the amount of, uh, amount of funding they get from private health funds? And can the minister provide payments uh, information on, this on whether there is a discrepancy between Medibank Private to South Australian private hospitals and what Medibank Private pays to other private hospitals in the rest of the Commonwealth? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank Zenas Bond for his second supplementary question. Uh, if we do uh, go to a Medibank Private, I can remind uh, Senator Xenophon and the Senate that uh, they are commercial arrangements uh, that Medic Medibank Private and, uh, would have with relevant uh, hospitals, uh, because uh, Medibank Private is uh, a government-owned enterprise, but as a commercial entity, it uh, does operate. Uh, and I'm sure uh, Senator Xenophon would be familiar with this at arm's length uh, from government, uh, ensuring that there is a level playing field with other private health insurers. However, uh, it is, uh, and I do understand that Medibank has offered uh, to brief uh, Senator Xenophon about uh, these operations. I certainly will take any part of that question uh, today that have been uh, put to, uh, to Minister Plebisek in respect of this matter for uh, her to see if she wants to provide any additional uh, information uh, in answer to it. Uh, and, uh, Order. And Time's expired. Senator Betts. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Carr. I refer the Minister to coalition questioning by Senators Ronaldson and Kroger at Senate Estimates on 31 May about AusAid funding paid to the Union of Agricultural Work Committees an organisation which has been accused of having links with the proscribed terrorist organisation, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. In particular, I refer the minister to his insistence that this organisation is registered in Israel as a not-for-profit organisation, a registration he pointed to as having been renewed on 5 March 2012. What due diligence was undertaken and by whom to confirm the true identity of the organisation repeatedly referred to by the minister as being registered in Israel as a not-for-profit. The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Bob Carr. Well, well, Mr President, I'm very happy to research that and provide the Senate with further information. But I'm in a position to say to the Senate, in Israel a little over a week ago, I had a meeting with the President. I met with the Prime Minister in the Knesset for over an hour. I met the Defence Minister for over an hour. I met, I met the leader 
of the Labor Party in the Knesset. I met several other members of the Knesset, and, and, and I met senior people in intelligence. And so, so concerned are they with the matter you raised that not one of them even made a passing reference to Australian aid going allegedly, allegedly to an organisation tainted Surely with not. terrorist support. I could not. I met, uh, I met a prominent uh, Australian Israeli citizen. I met at his home another minister in the government. Surely not. I met, I met uh, columnists and commentators, and nowhere during this visit nowhere. was this suggestion made that Australia nowhere. has somehow done the wrong thing in providing a bit of aid to an organisation that, in the impoverished Gaza, uh, in the impoverished Gaza provides Palestinian sure. families with seedlings so they can grow their own vegetables. So they can grow their own vegetables. That's what it does. That's what this malign organisation does. And, and who, is, who heads the Australian organisation through which this support is provided? Who heads it? Who heads it? Well, I'll give you a clue. His brother, an eminent, an eminent Christian, his brother was, for a time, the time treasurer. Time has expired. Order. Time's expired. Time's expired. Order. Time's expired. Senator Bob Cart, resume your seat. Order. Now, when there's silence, we'll proceed. Order. Order. No. The noise will cease because Senator Abetz is entitled to be heard in silence. Order. Senator Abetz. I assume the minister has taken the question on notice because he did not answer any aspect of it. The supplementary is, I refer the minister to the registration renewal purportedly for the Union of Agricultural Work Committees, which AusAid has now released under Freedom of Information. Is the minister fully satisfied that the Union of Agricultural Work Committees and the organisation to which the minister referred registered with the, Israel, with the Israeli not-for-profit registry are actually one and the same? The minister. Mr. President, so the proposition of the opposition is that we should withdraw aid. We should withdraw aid from an organisation that is allowed to exist and function Senate, in Senate, Israel. Senator, Senator, Senator Bob Carr, you need to come to the question. Yeah. Yeah. Senator Carr. Mr. President, Mr. President, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm addressing the question. I'm addressing the question, and in put, put, putting this, putting this, this information in. In, in context, it is highly relevant, highly relevant that the same charity, the UAWC, is supported by that hotbed of terrorism, the government of the United Kingdom, by Italy and Belgium, by the government of Japan and the European Union. They all provide funding to the same charity, which provides foodstuffs and seedlings to families in Gaza. So all those countries, Order. all those countries, Order. Order. European Senator Union, Bob Carr, you just resume your seat. Order. Resume your seat. Senator Brandis. Order. Order. Senator Brandis. Thank you, Mr. President. You did draw the minister's, minister's attention to the question. He did ignore you. With eight seconds to go, he should be drawn once again to the question, which was whether the minister was satisfied that Just two similarly named organisations were one and the same. That is the only thing Senator Abetz asked. Order. Senator. Oh, order. Senator. Senator Evans. Mr President, on the point of order, there is no point of order. Senator uh, 
uh, Bob Carr, in answering the question in his first statement of the primary question, indicate that he would attempt to respond to any of the detail in the Senator's question, but then set out some context about the particular organisation and Australia's uh, relationship with that. And in this, in this supplementary answer, he is providing further information as to what other countries are uh, providing support to this organisation, which is directly relevant to the question the Senator Abetz asked. The, the order, there's no point of order at the, at the minister. You've got eight seconds remaining. Mr President, in that context, therefore, I have confidence in the advice supplied to me about the status of this organisation. Senator Abetz. And Mr President, this is a serious matter. No accusations are being made and genuine information is being sought. Order. I again refer... Order. I again refer... Order. Senator Abetz. Oh, that should be withdrawn. Order. That clearly should I, be withdrawn by the Leader of the I, Government. Order. I did not... I, I must say, because of what's been going on, I did not hear that comment. You may well have heard it directly across the... Ch I did not. If he's not man enough to withdraw, order. I'll continue. Order. I again, order. I again refer the Minister to the registration renewal purportedly for the Union of Agricultural Work Committees. Who provided this registration to the government, and was it accompanied by a translation? If so, by whom was it translated? If the minister does not have this information, can he expeditiously provide it? Order. Order. Now, when there is silence, we will proceed. The minister. Mr President, I'll not only do that, but I'll go further. I'll have the, I'll have the Arabic material tabled in the House and the translation tabled in the House, and uh, I'll, I'll, do that. I'll do that after reminding the House that the Australian Federal Police investigated this allegation, that, uh, that AusAid, found, AusAid itself found no evidence of any UN Charter Act violation that there's been extensive consultation about this allegation with DFAT, the AFP, ASIO and the Australian government solicitor, foreign governments and international aid organisations. I underline this, point, underline this point that you won't have a secure peace in the Middle East. You won't have security for the State of Israel. You won't have an end to the accumulated decades of suffering while keeping the people of Palestine trapped in poverty without schools, without medical aid. We all want, we all want a two-state solution, and this is Time part has of that. Expired, Senator Evans. Mr. President, could I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper? Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Bernardi. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Wong to questions asked by Senators Brandis, Cormann, Birmingham and Bernardi. Mr Deputy President, there are times when one can be slightly embarrassed for their fellow senators. Today was one of those times for many South Australians, and that is because during Mrs Wong's bilious diatribe against the coalition side who asked some genuine and probing questions in regard to, to Olympic Dam and the decision by BHP Billiton to delay or, uh, or to stop any further investment of expansion of that, she mocked and derided the fact that only two South Australian senators asked her questions about it. Well, let me just say this, Mr Pre Deputy President, not one single Labor or Green senator asked any questions about the, perhaps the most profound uh, economic decision by a single company in at my state's history. Not what, in a, probably in Australia, as Senator Edwards says as well. And in fact, you can perhaps excuse the Greens at some level because yesterday, as a $30 billion investment in South Australia that would have generated hundreds of millions of dollars worth of proceeds to government, led to tens of thousands of jobs and a hundred years of economic prosperity, according to the former Labor Premier of South Australia, the Greens cheered. 
They cheered at the delay of it. They cheered because it wasn't proceeding. It was one of the most nauseatingly self-serving cheers that I've ever heard in this place, followed only by Senator Wong's triumphant sneering that you know, South Australians on this side of the chamber weren't asking questions. Well, not one Labor senator did either. And that is a shameful fact for all South Australian senators on the other side of the chamber. And I know there's one, two of them sitting here now ready to defend you know, their, their minister, whom secretly they can only be embarrassed about as the rest of us are. Because the embarrassment is compounded by the complete lack of a coherent or thoughtful or considered response by the minister. Now, Minister Wong, now we have on this side of the chamber had four years' worth of experience, as Minister Wong has um, plotted through a number of portfolios and without distinction, but today was shameful. Because I asked a very simple question, Mr Deputy President, a very simple question. Will the minister simply confirm whether the carbon tax makes it cheaper for BHP building to pursue the Olympic Dam expansion or more expensive? I only met with abuse. I only met with abuse because Senator Wong wasn't prepared to answer the question. Now, this should concern all of us, because not only is this chamber meant to get answers to very straightforward and simple questions, it is a question that the minister has spent four years preparing herself for. Four years. She went to Copenhagen as the climate change minister. She stood by as her, her prime minister you know, told an abject um, and willful lie to the Australian people before the election. She's defended the breaking of that promise before the election. She scrapped the citizens' assembly, the cash for clunkers, and everything else. She said, you know, she stood by and celebrated as, you know, the head of this workers' union, uh, Paul Howe, said, not one single job will be lost because of this carbon tax. Not one single job. He put his house on the line. But we know, we know all about houses in the Australian Workers' Union, don't we, Mr Deputy President? We know all about that. It wouldn't be his house, it would be someone else, some poor, poor flunky who's been paying his union dues for all these years would have been subsidising this house through one of these slush funds. That, according to the Prime Minister, might I say, who was young and naive when she said it, according to the Prime Minister, said all union bosses have slush funds for their re-election. Uh -huh. All of them. And we're about to hear from a couple in a moment. I can tell you, Senator Farrell there for a Start's going to get up. Maybe he can enlighten us about that and his credit card usage himself. But listen, I, yeah, that's exactly right, Senator Farrell. Have you ever had Bill the Greek come and do a fence for you? That's what we'd like to know. But, Mr. Deputy President, it is. This is perhaps the most significant thing that's happened in South Australia. The most significant thing, because a lot of South Australians have got behind this project, and for to have it dismissed in such a cavalier manner, when. This is so clearly an impact of Australia becoming a high-cost jurisdiction, and you cannot dismiss the fact, no matter how polite BHP Billiton may want to be because they're scared of the retribution of this vindictive and nasty government, but no matter how polite they want to be, the fact is if, if wage costs are going up, if the cost of capital is going up, if you've got additional taxes, mineral resource rent taxes, and you've got carbon taxes being imposed, the cost of the Olympic Dam expansion is going to go up as well. And they've simply made a decision with a limited amount of capital, we can invest it where we'll get the best return. Unfortunately for all South Australians, it's now going offshore thanks to this government. Thank you, Senator Bernardi. Senator Farrell. Thank you, Deputy President. And, uh, if I can just deal with that last point uh, first, uh, the high costs that uh, uh, Senator Bernardi refers to in terms of um, uh, mining, uh, mining costs uh, in Australia. Um, the fact of the matter is that the reason that wages have gone up in the mining industry is because there's been a mining boom. Uh, that's what's pushed up the cost of, uh, cost of labour uh, in, the, in the mining industry. We've, we've, had, we've had the largest the largest mining boom uh, in, our, uh, in our history. And that, of course, has been good for the country, um, but um, it does have an impact. It does have an impact, and of course, it's had some impact on uh, the Olympic Dam uh, development. Now, what worries me and what uh, I'm concerned about in terms of uh, Senator Bernardi's response, of course, is the, the delight that he appears to exhibit uh, in the fact that uh, this particular development has not been proceeded with at this stage. And he says, he says, he says, he, he, say, he says that as a South Australian senator, I should be embarrassed about the performance of Senator Wong. Now, 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 I have, I have never been, I have never been 
Uh, I have never been embarrassed about the performance of Senator Wong, uh, and I certainly was not embarrassed uh, about uh, her performance today because she's a great minister. She's a great minister. No, it does say a lot about me. Uh, but if I was Senator Bernardi, if I was Senator Bernardi, and Mr. Abbott was my leader, I can tell you what: I would have been embarrassed. I would have been significantly embarrassed about the performance that he delivered on the 7:30 report uh, last evening. Now let's go. Let's go back. Oh, yes, I'm coming. I, I would. Have, if anybody's going to be embarrassed in this debate, Senator Bernardi. It's going to be you and your party about Senator, uh, uh, Mr Abbott's uh, performance. Now, let's go back to yesterday afternoon. What did Mr Kloppers say was the reason for uh, not proceeding at this stage, at this stage with the uh, Olympic... Uh, uh, um, what, what, uh, I mean, look, I mean, the fact that Senator Bernardi continues to inter uh, interrupt... Uh, um, the or, fact that order, Senator, Senator Bernardi, order. You've had your turn. Senator Farrell, you have the call. Thank, thank you for that protection, uh, uh, De Deputy President. Thank you for that protection. Um, what, what, did, what did Mr. Kloppers say was the reason? He talked about uh, current market conditions, including uh, subdued uh, uh, market prices. One of the things he didn't talk about, as um, the implication. Uh, for um, uh, not proceeding was the, the mining tax. Um, the reason, of course, he didn't talk about the mining tax um, was because he knew what Mr Abbott didn't know uh, when he gave that 7.30 report uh, uh, interview last night. Um, what is Olympic Dam? What, what sort of mine is it? It's not a coal mine. It's not an iron ore mine. Uh, there are three... There, well, well... Well, I reject that. I, I or, absolutely, I absolutely reject that. Order on my that. left. Order. The fact, order the fact on of the my matter. left. Order. Right. Order. Just, just before I call you, Senator Farrell, order on both sides of the chamber, especially on my left. Uh, Senator Farrell is entitled to be heard. Senator Farrell, you have the call. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, um, Olympic Dam is a great project in South Australia. It continues, it, ten, it continues to be a great project and one of these days, one of these days, one of these days that project uh, will continue um, uh, to expand. Okay? The, the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is that dam continues, uh, Olympic Dam continues to uh, employ uh, people in South Australia. Uh, it continues to pay royalties to South Australia. Uh, and it will be one of Australia's great projects. And why? What I don't understand is, um, after after what uh, Mr. Klopper has said very clearly uh, yesterday afternoon, is why Mr. Abbott went on the 7:30 report last night, and when asked a very clear question, "Have you actually read BHP statements?" Mr. Abbott said, "No, no, I haven't." So there he is. There he is, Mr. Abbott. Mr. Mr. Abbott goes on uh, national television last night to to exploit to exploit the fact Order to exploit the fact that uh, we've had this disappointing news true it is Senator Farrell resume Senator Birmingham Mr Deputy President I think Senator Farrell is at serious risk of misleading the chamber by very selectively quoting no, no, the leader of the no opposition's of order, answer Birmingham. to questions he was asked last there is, night there is, no, there is no point of order that's debating the issue Senator Farrell you have the call I'll respond to that uh, Deputy President I'll read out the entire I'll read out the entire uh, quote from last night This is this is Sales's question I'm going to on the facts that Marius Klopper said today when he was directly asked if the decision on Olympic Dam was affected by Australia's tax situation, and I'm going on the facts that are outlined in the results statement uh, that has been issued. Have you actually read the Order. statement? Senator Sales Farrell, asked. Your time Abbott, has expired. No. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, I rise to take note of the answers by Senator Wong to questions from Senator Brandis Cormann, Birmingham and Bernardi. Mr Deputy President, there's been a lot of talk about who said what and who has read what, and I think it's important that we actually get some of the facts on the table. It is a fact that Maurice Klopp has said that the government has created a higher cost environment. It is a fact 
that BHP, in their statement yesterday, said that one of the reasons was the weaker outlook Order for commodity right. prices Order. and rising costs as the reasons for the pullback. In the 16th Senator of Conroy. May, Order. Jack Order Nasser said, I cannot overstate the level of uncertainty regarding tax. And in the statement on the 22nd of August regarding results, BHP said that costs, development and construction costs had surged by some $2.7 billion, and a third of that was a result of labour and industrial action. And as one of my colleagues highlighted, some 3,500 workers, BHP workers, on strike contributing to that. And what that says to people looking at investment is risk. And you have to price risk into your business plan. Now, it's instructive if we look at what other people in the same sectors, copper and gold, are looking at. And so Pan Ost, an Australian company, has copper operations around the world. It's got statements on its website looking at the feasibility of a program in Chile. And the number two factor that they consider listed is the cost of electricity. And they say the development of the Inca de Oro project depends on competitively priced power and water. Now, South Australia, as we all know, currently has the world's highest electricity prices. And before members opposite jump up and say, you know, that's all do, to do with infrastructure, the Essential Services Commission of South Australia has said that 25 per cent of the price rise is due to the carbon tax. Now, importantly, that's currently, that's at $23 a tonne. The government's own modelling, which BHP is well aware of, says that the carbon tax is going to increase to $350 a tonne. So if we currently have the world's highest electricity prices, with a carbon tax of $23 a tonne that have driven 25 per cent of the increase, and that tax is going up to $350 a tonne over the life of the project, which is the kind of time frame that BHP will be looking at, then is it any wonder that they say the project was canned because of rising costs? So look at the article in the Finn Review. It says the federal government should understand that mining super profits are not guaranteed. Australia is in a competition with other resource-rich countries and the BHP decision is a timely warning that we have allowed our cost base to increase too far and too fast thanks to our over-regulated labour market and overbearing environmental regulations. BHP Chairman Jack Nasser warned earlier this year that uncertainty surrounding our tax regime could deter investment. As BHP looks at the life of this program, they look at the fact that we already have the world's highest electricity prices here and we see from other players in the global market that power costs are their number two consideration to the feasibility of projects. Is it any wonder that BHP in their statement quoted rising costs as one of the reasons that that would be canned when this government is on track to raise the price per tonne of carbon from $23 to $350 in the future. It is a shame that this government doesn't think more about the future of South Australia, about the future of our children and their jobs and our economy than it does about the future of their current parliamentary term in coalition with their alliance partners, the Greens. Thank you, Senator Fawcett. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, I'd like to just point out one, uh, one fact that I am in agreement with uh, Senator Bernardi about the contribution from Senator Ludlam last night in uh, you know, sort of exulting in the fact that this uh, proposal will mean that uh, there will be less uranium mined and exported from Australia. But, but that's probably the only point of agreement. Those who know South Australia realise that copper is in its DNA. You know, if you go to the early formative days of the state, the copper mines of Burra underpinned the economy. Moonta, Wallaroo, the Copper Coast. The simple facts are, and I visit these places, Perry, Port Augusta, Wyala and Roxby, are vibrant communities that mine is a very valuable contributor to the South Australian economy. There are over 600 kids at primary school in Roxby. There are over 4,000 uh, 
uh, people living there. It's amongst one or two of the highest postcode earners of South Australia. It is a vibrant, continual contributor to the South Australian economy. The fact that it was going to undergo a tremendous multi-year development stage was muchly anticipated by all of the surrounding communities and all of the people in South Australia. And it, to my view, was a bipartisan project with the total support of all South Australians. And, and to see today people playing politics and trying to get a political advantage out of what is you know, a disappointing decision, something that is going to delay the further development of our great state, is quite, uh, you know, I'm quite uh, dissatisfied with that. I see people taking a short-term political advantage uh, over what should be a bipartisan approach to get this, uh, this project up and over the line. I mean, the development phase was four years to, to dig down up to 500 metres to expose the, the ore burden. But I suppose it's worth putting directly on the record some of the things that have been said, and it is really important that BHP has recognised that the South Australian government has been fully supportive of the Olympic Dam project and has created an environment that is highly conducive to business Order. investment. We have been very much encouraged by their attitude to business development and the Olympic Dam expansion project. I know that Tom Keats and Tonus, Premier Weatherall, moved every, uh, every effort and moved every obstacle in the path of BHP's decision. Let's be fair to Ingham about this. This is about the future of South Australia. Order. Let's be fair to Ingham. There is not a politician representing South Australia that would do anything in their electoral and in their power to make this project go ahead. But if iron ore is 113 US dollars a tonne, and it used to be 180 US dollars a tonne, if BHP has had a 34 per cent reduction in profit, if they have made some decisions worldwide which have cast into doubt their ability to expend $80 billion worth of capital right around this country and across the world, then don't be coming in here and saying it's Minister Wong's fault. Don't be coming in here and saying it's all the Labor Party's fault. This is a global multinational business that, quite frankly, makes its decisions independently and irrespectively of most of the place of governments where it deals. It has a, representative, a, a responsibility to its stakeholders and shareholders to define their longer-term development plans. This is a unique world-class ore body. As I said at the outset, copper particularly is in South Australia's DNA. Borough mines underpinned the development of the state. They stopped it from going bankrupt at one stage. It is my view that this BHP decision is a setback, a dramatic setback, but it's not the end of the journey. The ore body is still there. It is world class. The, the, the statements about industrial problems is absolutely ludicrous. There have been no impediments to a 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week efficient operation at Olympic Dam. Senator Edwards. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Wong uh, to questions asked by Senator Brandis, Cormann, Birmingham and Bernardi. Uh, it is, uh, but before I do, I just uh, don't go, Senator Gallagher. Uh, I just must refer to your comments about uh, the borough mine saving the state from bankruptcy. I hope those uh, words aren't prophetic about the current uh, state of affairs, because, as you well know, South Australia has a $13 billion debt. Uh, which I'm sure that Senator Farrell has now run out to ring up Peter Malinowskis to uh, start giving him his riding instructions to the Premier and the Treasurer of South Australia about uh, how they're going to recast their budget 
uh, in light of this decision, which for some reason has come as some complete shock until yesterday. This has been the worst kept secret in South Australia. I, I refer you to a, uh, a breakfast radio program on 5AA this morning with Keith Conlon and John Keneally. A note from a caller, and I quote, and to all the people out there listening, uh, Roxby is where Olympic Dam is. I worked up at Roxby on the expansion. My crew was demobbed on the 21st of July. That's about a month now, and we were told that BHP are delaying the expansion. I tried to contact the local federal ALP member, Nick Champion, but his office fobbed me off and claimed that I didn't know what I was talking about. It was just speculation. I told the guy there this was real. I was working there. I was happy there. I did nothing wrong, and now I'm unemployed, and that is the sentiment of what we're hearing now, uh, as you would be, as you say, Senator Gallagher, you travel around South Australia as I do, but we are hearing, as are you, that there's been 600 jobs lost in Roxby Downs over the last two months. Now, I must refer to Senator Farrell's comments. He talks about the, the cost of mining in this country. The high costs have driven BHP away from this decision. Well, as, uh, as we know, profits up which has driven wages growth. So what's going to happen now? What is going to happen now? We've got profit up, wages up. That's the scenario Senator Farrell put to us, and that's what's driven BHP away from this project. What's now? Profit down? Wages down? No, I don't think so. And what have we got? We've got, as Senator uh, uh, Fawcett and uh, Birmingham uh, raised earlier, three and a half thousand workers on strike, BHP workers on strike in the Bowen Basin as recently as May this year. You've got to understand that this has been the worst kept secret in corporate Australia. I mean, what, what, BHP share price up until two weeks ago was sliding down and down and down and down until such time as the corporate market realised, well, they're, they're not going to go ahead with this. They're giving us a nod and a wink in the marketplace that they're going to announce at this time that they're not going to go ahead. Well, what's happened to the share price since? It's gone up. And again today, the share price of BHP has risen on the strength of this announcement. What you have to understand on the other side there is that you've got carbon pricing, we call it a carbon tax, going out to $350. From $23 to $350 in the longer term. What do you think these companies think when they're doing their forward planning? Do they have that in Chile and in Russia, in all these other places where they have these business opportunities? No, they don't. And you wonder why the capital shifts. And the other reason why they can't do it, cost of capital. Why? Because if they borrow money in Australia, they're competing with the Australian government to borrow funds and the cost of capital has gone up and which is also putting pressure on other businesses as well. You can't consider Olympic Dam in the silo of BHP. BHP pays carbon tax all across its business in this country. And just to single it out and say, well they won't be paying carbon tax there. That's just like trying to say, well, I'll sell uh, milk bottles and snakes in my confectionery store and we, we, you know, we, we'll put all those in a profit silo each. You just can't do it. You take the money out of the till at the end of the day and that's what it's all about. I don't know how Premier Weatherall is now going to task this, uh, this debt that he's got. I'm sure that he'll be calling on his Labor colleagues now, but he should have done that well before now and have told all of you South Australian Labor senators that this tax is not sustainable and it's going to continue to bring down our economy. The Senator Rhiannon. Uh, it's not on this matter, um, Mr okay, Acting we'll, Deputy We'll put the question first. The, the question is that the motion moved by Senator Bernardi be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Senator Rhiannon. Mr. Acting Deputy President, I wish to um, take note of the comments made by Foreign Minister Mr. Uh, Senator Carr. Is leave granted? Leave's granted. Senator Ian. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the response from the minister to the question that I put about the, um, if aid money will be used to, uh, in any way for the detention centres that um, are, are earmarked for Manus Island 
and Nauru uh, certainly left open the possibility. Um, the way his response was phrased, talking about the tangential, tangential use of the money, uh, I did find concerning. The foreign aid budget is a most, impo most important, a very important part of our budget, and clearly earmarked to relieve poverty, world poverty, and also um, very specifically in terms of addressing the Millennium Development Goals. Now, this is an area where there is so much work to be done. To hear that some of that money that. Uh, I believe the majority of Australians understand will be used by the government in partnership with uh, governments in low-income countries, various multi, uh, international finance institutions and multilateral development agencies such as the Asian Development Bank and the um, Food and Agricultural Organisation and many other bodies that I believe the public un would expect that the money is being used directly by Australia or with such bodies to assist people. Now, sometimes aid projects may have a bit of a question mark over them, but certainly that's what they're um, it's set out. The foreign aid budget is about assisting people and the environment in low-income countries, and that's how that money should be spent. To divert that money to um, build the detention centres on Nauru and Manus Island, uh, I think is a betrayal of the trust of the Australian people, their, um, th their understanding of how um, government processes work. That uh, Yes, the government has been successful because it was able to uh, work it out with the coalition and come forward with this very damaging legislation about refugees. Uh, but to now uh, uh, to misuse money in the aid budget uh, really furthers the damaging aspects of the legislation that was passed a couple of weeks ago. In Papua New Guinea itself, it's one of the countries with the highest rate of AIDS, malaria, uh, the violence against women is extreme. Just in the past two mornings in this place, we've had uh, breakfast with uh, people working in the aid area who are doing fine work. And what constantly comes up when you talk to them is the need for there to be greater allocation of, the, of money from the budget of a country like Australia to meeting our international obligations. It was actually back in the 1990s when uh, the former Prime Minister John Howard was in office. He actually gave the commitment to the Millennium Development Goals, which were clearly linked to Australia reaching 0.7 per cent of its aid budget, uh, 0.7 per cent of GDP to be allocated to the aid budget. And that still to this day hasn't been achieved. And we saw that the Australian government um, in, in the most recent budget brought down by the current government uh, fur further backed off on moving towards increasing the aid allocation. So it's going to increase at a much slower rate than we expected. The 0.5 per cent allocation expected by 2015 now um, has blown, blown out by a number of years. So then to further hear that, the, that money that is so important to address um, health health and education issues for people, uh, particularly in our own region in developing countries, uh, to address water sanitation, um, female participation, improve, assist uh, these countries in improving their democratic processes. And we're losing some of that budget that is so important that it goes on these programs, um, on the detention centres that are just so damaging to the people who are attempting to escape very oppressive, difficult lives. They've got a right to come to this country. Now they're going to be forced to go to these detention centres and we're misusing our aid budget. So I did find the response from the minister very troubling. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. The question is, the motion moved by Senator Rhiannon be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Minister. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to incorporate uh, Senate uh, questions without notice, which has provided additional answers by Senator Conroy uh, to uh, Senator Madigan. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, in addition, I table the Bald Hills Wind Farm BAT 
an uh, AV fauna management plan. Thank you. Next matter on order of business, are there any ministerial statements? No. Then we move on to presentation of other documents. On behalf of the President, I present the annual report of 2011-12 of the Standing Committee on Appropriations and Staffing. Whip. I move that the report be printed. Move that the motion be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. On behalf of the President, I present the report of the Australian Parliamentary Delegation to the United States of America, which took place from 27 September to 29 October 2011. I also present the report of my official visit to Peru, which took place from the 24th to the 26th of September 2011. On behalf of the President, I present a response from the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Senator Bob Carr, to a resolution of the Senate of 21 June 2012 concerning the Australian-Vietnam Human Rights Dialogue. Minister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I table a correction to the explanatory memorandum relating to the Legislative Instruments Amendment, Sunsetting Measures Bill 2012. Are there any reports from committees? Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, on behalf of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit, I present two reports of the committee as well as executive minutes on various reports and I seek leave to move a motion in relation to the reports. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator McEwen. Uh, I move that the Senate take note of the reports. The motion is that those reports be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. On behalf of Senator Polly, I present a corrigendum to the report of the Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee on the Government Investment Funds Amendment Ethical Investments Bill 2012, uh, 2011, tabled today, and move that the document be printed. The question is the motion be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Are there any documents to be presented by the clerk? Clark. Documents are tabled pursuant to statute. Details will be recorded in the journals of the Senate and on the dynamic red. And a letter of advice is tabled in accordance with the continuing order on departmental and agency contracts. On behalf of the President, I have received letters from a party leader seeking variations to the membership of committees. Minister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion to vary uh, the membership of committees. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. Uh, thank you. I move that Senator Milne be appointed to the Select Committee on Electricity Prices and Senator Seawitt be appointed to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporation, Corporations and Financial Services. The question is the, motive, the motion be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Sorry. Clark. Business of the Senate, order of the day number four. Resumption of debate on a disallowance motion moved by Senator Wish Wilson in relation to the small pelagic fishery total allowable catch quota species determination. Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting, Acting Deputy President. As I was saying, uh, Dr Daniel Pawley of the University of British Columbia has recently ranked Australian fisheries second out of 53 countries for environmental sustainability. A report by the United Nations Food Agriculture Organisation also recognised Australia's effective fishing management, particularly our actions to rebuild overfished stocks. Australian fisheries are not the fisheries of Europe or of Africa, or even of those of New Zealand. Some of the comparisons that have been raised in this debate between the proposals of an Australian business and Australian independent fisheries management with statutory obligations are frankly uh, unnecessary and to some degree alarmist. The Australian Bureau of Agricultural and Resource Economics and Science, ABARES, uh, 2010 fisheries status reports shows the results of the continued effort 
we have taken to guarantee we have healthy fish stocks. The report shows that 2005, 24 stocks were classified as overfished and or subject to overfishing, and 2010 that number had fallen to just 13 stocks. In addition, the proportion of stocks whose status is uncertain has nearly halved since 2007 as a direct result of the policies uh, of this Gillard Labor government. Turning to the small pelagic fishery, which uh, seems to have uh, raised uh, people's uh, concern. This debate has focused on uh, that fishery, the small pelagic fishery, as this is where Sea Fish Tasmania has said it intends uh, to exercise uh, its fishing uh, entitlements. The small pelagic fishery is based on a strong precautionary principle in the setting of catch limits. Under the harvest strategy for this fishery, the catch limits is capped at a maximum of 20 per cent of the estimated available biomass, which takes into consideration both the species, productivity and the broader ecosystem impacts. Uh, this is a very conservative limit when compared to similar stocks uh, in international uh, fisheries. Even with that cap, the current management plan sets the quota to less than 10 per cent of spawning biomass estimates, leaving 90 per cent uh, in the ocean. These stock limits are based on science and, excess, and assessed by uh, the experts. Uh, the arrangements meet or exceed the most rigorous scientific uh, requirements for an ecologically sustainable fishery of this kind and takes the precautionary principle uh, to uh, the appropriate level. Uh, many speakers in this debate have noted a paper released this week by some of Australia's top fishery scientists from the Institute of Marine and Antarctic Studies, the South Australian Research and Development Corporation and the CSIRO Wealth Promotions National Research Flagships. In this report, the scientists make it clear that the settings in the small pelagic fishery are conservative by world standards and sustainable for the environment. For the issue of localised depletion, the report states that the measures in place in the fishery and I quote, taken together, give confidence that the food web impacts of the SPF on predators and the SPF species themselves, including through localised depletion, are unlikely. End of quote. AFMA manages fisheries in real time, and AFMA has the power to take immediate action uh, if and when required. And as uh, I have stated, I'm frequently reminded by commercial fishers how seriously AFMA takes uh, its responsibilities in all its fisheries. Turning to the uh, FV Margiris, I'll now turn to the issue of the proposed midwater trawler itself. It's helpful for the Senate uh, to uh, understand that there are a number of steps involved in bringing a fishing vessel uh, into Australia and using it, as, uh, using it in an Australian uh, fishery. In the first instance, a ship must be recognised as an Australian vessel. Uh, presently, Sea Fish Tasmania has uh, begun an application for the FV Margiris with the Australian Marine Safety Authority in order to be flagged as an Australian vessel. But there are a range of steps that, ask that AMSA is required to undertake to grant that status. Next, every Australian fishing vessel seeking to operate in Commonwealth fisheries is required to be approved by AFMA. To date, AFMA has not received an application by the company Seafish Tasmania for that vessel to operate in Commonwealth fisheries. The FV Margiris would be, uh, should it uh, uh, ask, be required to adhere to the strict management arrangements for the SPF, including carrying an AFMA observers on board to monitor fishing activities and using bycatch mitigation equipment such as seal excluders, uh, devices, logbook reporting, satellite vessel monitoring systems and mandatory reporting of any, of any interactions with protected species. Obviously, there are other regulations that apply to fishing in Australian waters, one of which being the enforcement of the Commonwealth's marine reserve regime. Uh, this disallowance motion being moved by the Greens uh, is uh, misplaced uh, and does not address uh, and, in fact, uh, can quite rightly harm uh, fishing uh, across uh, the uh, uh, Australian Commonwealth waters. Senator Seawitt last night stated that she couldn't remember a time 
when recreational fishers stood side by side with her uh, on an issue. Well, for the record, there was a time when the Greens and ENGOs stood for output controls and moved away from output at, from gear restrictions in fisheries management. What they did was uh, uh, the disallowance, uh, in fact, in that area, uh, when uh, they wanted to move to uh, ensuring that we had output controls, which we now have in place, which deal with the sensible way of determining, uh, through independent experts, total allowable catches for fishers, rather than uh, the size of a boat, the gear it uses, the effort uh, that it might have, in other words, gear restrictions types, because uh, everyone recognised that that type of operation, where you then regulated the gear itself, was uh, no longer relevant for today. So turning to this disallowance motion uh, is a message that the Greens political party doesn't support sustainable catch limits based on science. <coughs> it's a message that the Greens want fisheries managed by politics, not qualified fishers managed, uh, fisheries managers. And it says that the Greens do not support the commercial operators who fish in some of the world's uh, best managed uh, fisheries. That message should be well understood because I've no doubt that the same disregard for the science and management of our commercial fishers uh, will be extended to the legitimate pursuit of recreational fishers. As Minister for Fisheries, I'm not going to allow the emotive politics of the Greens political party to run fisheries management policy in this country. We will ensure that the Australian Fisheries Management Authority uh, is independent. It makes independent decisions based on the science through its expert uh, commissioners and on the facts that are presented to them and on the science uh, they will continue to make uh, sound judgment on our fisheries to ensure that they are sustainable, ecologically uh, uh, meet uh, all the requirements and, uh, more so, it's predicated on the, the uh, precautionary principle which is espoused by the Greens so often. Why? Because it is a sound policy that AFMA applies to ensure that we have sustainable, fishes, uh, sustainable fisheries now and into the future. And uh, for those uh, reasons, uh, the government uh, does not uh, support uh, this motion. <coughs>